Okay, DJ, the floor is yours. Great, wonderful. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to give this uh, introduction to information theory. And uh, my writ, as given to me by David Walpert, was to give a basic introduction to the topic covering the main basic concepts that are necessary for it. I'm not specifically going to make reference to stochastic thermodynamics, although this is a straight introduction to information theory, classical information theory as a subject. So let me start by talking about uh, the outline for today's lectures. Um, let's see if this will move. Uh, there's a little bit of a delay from when I move my iPad and when I talk, so I hope that's not too uh, unnerving. So this will consist, this lecture consists of four parts. There will be a very short motivation for what we're trying to do. Then I will discuss the notion of entropy, which takes the role of the basic quantification of what we call information in information theory and is related to entropy in statistical physics. Then I will discuss the notion of mutual information, which is a concept that discusses uh, the how, how much information one variable gives you about another, another very important concept in this topic. Um, and finally, I'll discuss the concept of relative entropy, which is a kind of uh, entropic or information theoretic measure of the difference between probability distributions. I will not discuss, there won't be time in one hour to discuss applications of this kind of thing uh, to things like stochastic processes and to uh, things in stochastic thermodynamics, but I think um, with some imagination, you'll be able to figure out many ways of using these kinds of tools in the kinds of topics of interest in the, uh, uh, in the program. That you guys are in. So let me begin with the first part, which is the motivation. And our motivation is to quantify the notion of information. So you could ask the question, what is information? And the foundation of this topic is the work of Claude Shannon, who thought about this in terms of how much uh, you learn from a stream of messages. So he considered, for example, a stream of zeros and ones. And if you're thinking in terms of neurons, you might think about a spike, like a voltage spike and no voltage spike. If you're thinking in terms of digital messages, you would think in terms of you know, literally zeros and ones in your digital signal and so on. You know, so basically a binary signal stream. And you observe the following kinds of things. So for example, suppose you have a message stream that looks like zero, 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 it's always zero. Then it's clear that if I've told you that you always get zeros, that each new zero tells you nothing, and it tells you nothing because there's no uncertainty in what it's going to tell you. You already know it's always going to be a zero. So there's no, no in some sense, no new information in each occurrence of a symbol in this stream. Evidently, we have the same situation if you always have ones. But on the other hand, if sometimes you have zeros and sometimes you have ones, uh, well, your surprise at each new symbol that you see is informative. It tells you something that you didn't know from having viewed the previous sequence of symbols. So information theory seeks to quantify this kind of surprise and try to use that to study how much information is transmitted between one thing and another thing. Okay. Some things that are clear from this is that if you have a bigger vocabulary, you can send more information. So for example, if instead of using zeros and ones, you used ones, twos, and threes, and zeros, then you know there are more messages you can send. So in some sense, uh, because you can send more messages, you can say more things. So actually, as it'll turn out, information is the quantification of kind of how many messages you can send. It's a count in some sense, as we will see, of the number of things that you can say. Another thing that seems clear from this is that correlation reduces surprise and therefore reduces the amount of information you can send. This is sort of sometimes uh, counterintuitive because you think that things are correlated, they tell you about each other. They may tell you about each other, but the point here is that suppose you have a situation where every time you see a one, I promise you, you're going to see another one, right? You're going to see two ones in a row. So if that's the case, then every time uh, there's no point seeing the second one, if you like. So that's sort of a wasted message uh, in this case. And so you have a situation that essentially you could replace the one one with the one tilde. And uh, in this way, the correlation between the one and the one is reducing surprise and reduces the information you have. So from this point of view, you would be the most surprised, that is, you would learn the most from each symbol if they all appear to be completely randomly 
distributed. Now that seems very confusing because it would appear that random things are the most informative, but from this perspective, that's true. If what you're quantifying is surprise, then it is true that you get more information when the signal looks less correlated or more random. I'll take the question in a moment. So you might describe this as follows, a picture that one draws in information theory, something like this, where you say you have a signal, the signal passes through an encoder and comes out as an encoded response or output, and you learn the most of R appears to be essentially a random sequence of zeros and ones. Okay. Uh, there's a question from Tabasmita. Tabasmita, you can uh, unmute and uh, ask your question. So let me keep going. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, so then, so suppose we agree with this perspective, you could ask, how can we quantify informative surprise? Well, that's what we need to do to understand uh, how, to, uh, how to quantify information. So we're going to start with binary symbols, let's say zeros and ones. And for the moment, I'm also going to assume that the symbols are statistically independent. So I'm going to assume here that there is no correlation from time to time. Right? So what do we want? So qualitatively, some desiderata we might have, things we might want, might be to say, let's suppose that P of Ri is the probability of using symbol Ri, it's the frequency of use. Then in terms of a measure of surprise, it should be the case that the surprise associated with the probabilities P ought to be a decreasing function of P. Since the more frequently we make use of the symbol Ri, the less surprising it should be. So that's one thing you might imagine. So another thing you might hope for, it would be nice if this were true, is that if you had two independent measurements, here I'm imagining from two different neurons, but it could be from two different signal channels or whatever else you want from two different kinds of uh, sources of signals. And so here I'm phrasing this in terms of neurons because you know I do work in theoretical neuroscience. So suppose you have the surprise associated with the response of two independent signaling units, you might hope that the surprises add. That doesn't have to be the case, obviously, in your measure of surprise, but it would be nice to have surprise be additive for independent events. And this should be true for any probability distribution P. And so we're led to consider that the measure of surprise ought to be the logarithm, because the logarithm of the product of things becomes the sum of the logarithm. So it would have these two properties of this being a decreasing function of the argument, and what is more, having this uh, additive property. So we could take many logarithms with many bases, and if we take base two, the quantity we derive is going to be called bits. If you take base E, it's going to be called mats. But you know, using the usual rule <coughs> for conversion between bases, you can pick whichever base you want. So um, Shannon basically used this idea, you know, there's an idea of coming up with the definition to define the entropy of a probability distribution as being associated with the average surprise. At, uh, uh, so you take the symbols Ri, the surprise associated with the symbol, with seeing the symbol is the logarithm of the probability distribution. You sum it all up over the probability, over the symbols. So in this case, it could be just zeros and ones. And that is your notion. That is the notion of entropy. So uh, if you have more than two symbols, it's not binary, one through n, then the entropy is the sum from one through n of p of ri log p of ri with a minus sign out front. Now, this was a heuristic derivation. We kind of intuited this definition and as a measure of surprise. But, you know, the way in which people come up with definitions of anything is that you have to guess a formula that would probably do the job for you. And then you ask yourself whether the formula is useful. And it indeed turns out that the, word, that the entropy, this thing, is the answer to many questions in statistics and physics. So rather than coming up with it in this heuristic way, we could have instead asked many kinds of statistical questions and the answer would have turned out to be the entropy. So we'll talk about that in a minute. And just as a connection, to the physics. But whoever it is who's got their thing on, please mute it. So, so in physics, um, you know, uh, the if you agree that P is the probability of different microstates in a system, for example, different kinds of you know states of a gap, 
mass, then it does turn out that this quantity H reproduces the thermodynamic entropy of a system and gives it a statistical interpretation. Indeed, that is why Shannon originally called this the entropy, because if you applied it to the distribution of statistical physics, you reproduce the uh, thermodynamic entropy. So for us, our interest is in asking the question, what does entropy mean in terms of information? So uh, we are going to argue by sort of going through examples and things and by using a theorem called the asymptotic equipartition theorem that the entropy of a probability distribution, roughly speaking, tells you how much information is available in the signal in the absence of noise. And equivalently, it is going to tell you, it is going to quantify for you the logarithm of the number of possible different messages sent through the channel. So this is the sense in which it quantifies information. The idea is that each message is worth the same amount, right? There's no value or difference in value between different messages. So you count the total number of messages that could be sent by the channel and you take the log and that is the entropy. It's a count of how many things you can say. So from statistical physics, you'll also recognize that this is very much like the microeconomical ensemble where the microeconomical entropy is the logarithm of the total number of configurations accessible to a system. Anyway, so our goal is to explain these interpretations and their origin. That's what we're going to start with today. First of all, before doing that, it's uh, sort of or on the way to doing that, it's just helpful to work out a couple of examples to understand these definitions. So let's suppose, for example, the symbols can take the value 0 and 1. In other words, you've got a binary signal. And let's suppose the probability of 0 is p0, and the probability of 1 is 1 minus p0 then the entropy is minus p0 log p0 plus 1 minus minus 1 minus p0 log 1 minus p0 and you can sort of work this out in various cases in the limit that p0 the probability of a zero is zero or the probability of zero is one and if you plug in the numbers you'll find that in both those cases you get zero and conversely if you maximize the entropy you take dh dp naught and set that equal to zero well a quick calculation shows you get you have to solve the equation minus log p naught plus log one minus p naught equals zero. Solving that, you get the answer that the entropy for this binary case is maximized when p naught equals one half. So, in other words, um, if we had a, a channel uh, that was transmitting binary signals, and I ask how much entropy it has, that is to say, how expressive this channel is, how surprised I am at seeing every symbol, the entropy is vanishes. If the probability, if you always send ones, so the probability of zero is zero, you always, or if you always send zeros, which is to say the probability of zero is one, and is maximized when both ones and zeros occur with equal probability. So that tells us that a well encoded sequence, namely that maximizes your surprise and then conveys as many messages as possible, basically looks random to the viewer. If you compute the entropy for the particular case, the P naught equals one half, of the maximum here, plug it in, you get minus one half log one half, and then you have here from here, you have the one minus p naught, so that's one half to also minus one half log one half, and that's one bit, so you get one bit per symbol transmitted in this case. So you can extend this just to make it clear that we can do this in a more general cases than binary signals. Suppose you had many values, ri going from one through n, you could plug in probability of ri's, uh, you know, you could write down the entropy, and then you could maximize the entropy by requiring the dhdpi, pi being the probability of any symbol p of ri equals zero for all i with the constraint that of course the probability is sum to one. And with a little bit of work or by using symmetry, you can conclude that this, the entropy is maximized by the uniform distribution where all the symbols are used equally often. And plugging in pi equals one over n, if you, you know, you have to do minus the sum on i, pi log pi, each of these things is one over n. So you get one over n log one over n, you sum it all up and you'll find the answer is log n bits of entropy come out of the signal. Okay, so roughly speaking, what we've said here is the entropy is maximized in the absence of constraints by the uniform distribution. So one way of conceptualizing what this is supposed to say is the language that's often used is I'm going to use that I'm going to keep talking about the information channel as being a neuron here just because for, for concreteness but it's any kind of information channel you want. So what this says is that you maximize the entropy which we can think of the amount of information you transmit per symbol uh, 
when you use the bandwidth, namely the expressive range of the signaling channel here on neuron as evenly as possible. So that's the idea here. So, for example, in this case, taking the neuron as our example again, if it encodes information in sort of bursts of messages and bursts of spikes of different lengths, etc., then you would, uh, like, say, you could have one, uh, you go boom or boom, boom or boom, 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 you know, m uh, multiple spikes like that. If you use them equally often, it maximizes the information. Okay, so another thing that often comes up, especially in physics, is you have a variable that takes continuous values. So let's think about how you would write down a similar notion of entropy for a continuous variable. So, well, one obvious procedure to follow is you first bin it in fixed increments of size delta r, and then you would declare the probability of ri times delta r is the probability that the variable r lies between ri and ri plus delta r. Then for this discretized or slightly coarse-grained distribution, you could write down the entropy and it would be p delta r log p delta r summed on i, and you wind up with the following thing. You wind up that breaking up the log, the log of the product, into a sum. You'd find that this is minus the sum p of r i delta r log p of r i minus the sum on i delta r p of r i log delta r. So the reason I've split this up is now I take the limit to take the continuum limit that delta r goes to zero, and the first term here becomes what's called the differential entropy. It's the integral of the continuous variable p log p with a minus sign. But the second term annoyingly diverges because there's a log delta r which is going to diverge. So what does this mean? Well, you know, what this means is that, you know, if you actually believe in um, real numbers, you actually believe that you can distinguish the 10,000th decimal place in these different numbers. So that means you're actually committing to the infinite precision in real numbers. And so this infinity reflects the infinite precision of real numbers in the, in the infinite number of decimal places, so that there's information in all of them. So in any real situation, you typically have a finite bin size, or there's some coarse screening that happens due to noise. And this term is basically a constant, and you can drop it because you see this stuff integrates to one, and this is a constant that reflects the precision with which you can understand the variable. So there's some relationship here between the amount of information you have, the renormalization group, and coarse graining of the system, but well, okay. Another thing that's worth pointing out about, about the second term is the second term, although it's sort of annoying, it always cancels when you compare entropies. So if you take the entropy of one distribution, P, and another distribution, Q, and you take the difference, this constant term will cancel. So um, traditionally what you do is you sort of forget about it. You don't keep this term around and you just look at this part, which is the differential entropy. And for all really physical questions you ask, that's the thing that'll matter. And this artificial divergence will not matter. So one final comment about this kind of examples. So one thing that we've uh, ignored so far is the possibility that your stream of signals has correlations in it. So how do you deal with that? Well, suppose your correlations occur in blocks of size k. If your correlations occur in blocks of size k, we might uh, divide the overall signal into words of length k. So here's a, wor a word of length k, another word of length k, etc. And then instead of talking about the probability of the symbols, maybe the binary symbols, let's say, that make up the word, we might instead say that we'll talk about the probability of the word as an object in and of itself. So then what we could do is to work out the surprise per word, because I know this is a correlated block. So you work out the surprise per word, or in other words, the information per word in the absence of noise. And so that's like taking the entropy of words of length k is minus the sum on all words, the probability of the word, log probability of the word. And so, of course, each word itself can consist of a sequence of symbols, so a sum over i1 through ik, which are possible symbols in the word of probability, log probability, and that gives us, you know, the entropy of these words. And then if you wanted to get an entropy rate or entropy per symbol in this sequence, you would divide by the lengths of these blocks of these words, and you would get the entropy rate is 1 over k, hk, and that's going to tell you how much you can learn every time you see a symbol.
Okay, by the way, nobody is keeping their cameras on, so I have absolutely no idea if people are following this or not, unlike an in-person lecture. So please feel free to turn on your cameras. That would be very helpful. And of course, feel free to ask questions because uh, that might also be helpful. Okay. Yes, uh, sorry to interrupt Vijay. So actually there is a question in the chat. So there is a question from Fazir. And uh, the question is uh, why this diverging term can be considered as a constant? So if you look at it, uh, I'm looking at this uh, diverging term. This thing here is log delta r. Delta r is a fixed number. It's the bin size. So that's just a number. That's just some fixed constant, which will get take to be larger and larger minus log delta r as you increase, of course, the uh, as you make the bin size smaller, this number will get larger. So that's the divergence in question. But this thing here, the integral dr p of r is one. So this is really gone. So this is really a constant. And the question is, what is the meaning of that constant and has to do with the precision of the real numbers? And again, if you compare the entropies of two things, as we mostly will later, this will go away. Does that answer your question? Okay, so I don't know if it answered the question because the person didn't respond. I think there may be another question. Biswajit? Yes, I, I think Vishwajit, you can uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. So, yes, Vishwajit? Yeah, no, I, I think, yes, you, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, I think uh, in the previous example, I mean, this example where you are taking a uh, word of length k, so you are considering the uh, correlation between the bits in that word, or uh, two words yeah. are not correlated, right? Exactly. So I assumed that to be the case. I assumed that the words were independent of each other. At least that's the way I treated this right now. I'm talking about correlations and blocks of size k. Okay, but. Uh, Okay, okay, but okay, you can divide it like that so that both two words are uncorrelated, basically. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm imagining such a situation. I'm sort of imagining, suppose that is the case, because the next thing I'm going to do yeah. is I'm going to say, I'm going to, next thing I'm going to say is that, well, suppose you've got arbitrarily correlated sequences, because really what's going to happen in real life is that the correlation length, you know, they may be some correlation like there's something and the correlations will die off a distance but it doesn't mean that they're going to be separated by blocks so um a way yeah, yeah. of that's what it, right that's exactly what you're going after uh, so a way of dealing with that is you first artificially chop it up in blocks of length k go ahead and calculate and then take the limit that yeah. k goes to infinity so that is one method amongst others of trying to get the answer for arbitrarily ah, okay. okay great so i thought that's where you were going thanks yeah, yeah, good. Okay, Thanks. excellent. So let me go to the next page. Okay, there are many nice properties that the entropy has, and I'm going to start listing properties, and then we'll use them for various things. One important property is something called the chain rule. The chain rule goes like this. So suppose you have two variables, x and y, and you compute the entropy jointly of these two variables. So in other words, I have the joint, uh, so here really what I mean is that you have the joint distribution P of X and Y, and we want to compute the entropy of that distribution. So there's a statement that this is equal to the entropy of just the variable X, namely of the marginal distribution over X, and then plus the conditional entropy of Y given X. So you condition on the variable X and you see what how much you know about y, what the distribution of y is, and you compute the entropy of that. So I should say, um, a caution is, I'm going to be flipping notations periodically depending upon what's convenient. Sometimes I write h of p, meaning the entropy of some probability distribution, and sometimes I use a notation h of x, where p here is a distribution p of, over x. So I should probably write some, uh, what just happened? Ooh, gosh, I have no idea what just happened. Okay, so um, so where here, what I mean is that uh, 
uh, here this is, uh, p is a probability distribution over x. So sometimes I'll, I'll write the distribution in term, uh, the entropy in terms of the sample space instead of the distribution. So I'm sorry about that notational change. Sometimes it's more convenient to do it that way. Anyhow, so let's see. Suppose you want to compute the entropy of two variables, uh, of a distribution on two variables, x and y. Well, that's a sum on both x and y of the joint distribution log the probability of x and y. So now, as usual, we can factorize this distribution into the conditional distribution p of y given x times p of x. Then the log splits this into log of the probability of x plus log of the probability of y given x over here. And here, what I've also done is I've taken p of x and y and split that into the probability of x times the probability of y given x, but just factorized. So now if you look at this, over here, over here, if I sum over y, for free, I'm left with the expression for the entropy of x. And here, if I sum over, something's gone wrong with the, uh, with the size of this thing. Let me just uh, try to see if I can take this and uh, shrink it, uh, resize. Um, amazing. Um, there, ah! What just happened? Resize. Still getting used to this, clearly. So then I can take grab this and I can move this. Okay, great. Well, that seemed to work. Okay, so did it work? You, you're you seeing a different screen there than I am by the look of it. No, um, I'm seeing you okay now. Okay, that's my screen. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so if you look at this, then on the one hand, this expression after I sum on y is precisely the expression for p of x log p of x, that's the entropy of x. And the second expression after I sum on x, uh, after I sum on uh, y here, so here I sum on x, and after I sum on y here for free, this becomes precisely the uh, uh, the expression for the entropy of y given x. Yeah, I think I've set this backward. I think here I can sum on free for free on y, and here I can sum on x for free. Okay, great. So all told, uh, you, you see, here's the chain rule theorem which says the entropy of x and y is the entropy of x plus the conditional entropy of y given x. And you can chain this repeatedly, and you can get the entropy of some set of variables x1 through xn is given by this kind of expression, where you take the first variable, you condition on the remainder, then you take the second variable, and then you condition that on the remainder, and you keep going in a chain like this, and this is called a chain rule uh, for, uh, in, for, uh, for entropy, and you can get that by recursive application of this uh, of the of the of this first result, and we're going to use this in a moment to get some interesting result out. Okay, so um, now before I uh, uh, so we'll use that in a little bit, but first before I uh, move on, I want to talk a little bit again about the meaning of entropy. So uh, we have here. By the way, there's a huge lag in how my screen is being transmitted. So this is not the on your screen, are you seeing the page on mutual information? Yes. Okay, because that's not what's on my screen. Ah. So this must be kind of confusing. Um, how do we trigger it to be my screen? That is yes. my screen. Oh, okay, this now screen. the meaning of entropy again. Yes, because that's what I want to talk about before I go to mutual information. <laughs> oh, no. What is it doing? Let's hope it's stable now. Okay. Okay, let's see. So uh, we're going to talk about the meaning of entropy again. I hope. I'm writing on my screen. It's not showing up. I have no idea what to do about this. Uh, why is it so slow? I, is my voice coming through okay? Uh, yes, so now we are seeing page 100, 
the meaning of entropy again. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, well, let's just keep going. So, so we have here, uh, once again, this picture that you have a signal, you have an encoder, and you have an output of the encoder R. Okay. And now let me suppose that R has an entropy H. And let's suppose that that, and that H is given by this formula, minus P of Ri log P of Ri. Just by the way, I'm using my pen and marking on my screen. I think by and large, it's not showing up in your screen. We'll just have to do our best with the situation. So, okay. So there is a theorem, a famous and super important theorem called the asymptotic equipartition theorem that says the following thing. Suppose you draw a sequence of messages from a distribution, a sequence of symbols from a distribution with an entropy H. The statement is the following. So suppose I draw, I, I want to transmit a message of length L, where L is very large. Well, clearly, the number of possible sequences that I could send is n to the L, where n is the number of possible symbols I could have used. So I could have sent n to the L symbols. So that's 2 to the L log n. Okay. The asymptotic equipartition theorem says that if you transmit your messages using a distribution over the symbols of entropy H, then in fact, a lot of the mess possible messages never get sent. What actually happens is that there is a smaller set called the typical set. The typical set has a size 2 to the power of the entropy times L. This is much less than 2 to the power L log M, which is the total number of messages you could send. And what's more, every single element of the typical set occurs with an equal probability of 2 to the minus HL. So what this is saying is that the understanding that entropy, the, uh, the quantity entropy gives us is that if you send a long sequence of messages, after a long sequence of messages, the distribution over possible messages becomes uniform within the typical set and is zero outside the typical set. It's an extremely powerful theorem. Right? This fact you can use for all manner of results. We'll, I'll discuss later how you use this to prove other very important theorems in information theory. Effectively, the asymptotic equipartition theorem converts any probability distribution into the uniform distribution over the typical set, where the size and shape of the typical set is defined by the entropy of the distribution you're using to draw the symbols. Okay, and you can use this to prove all kinds of things. So you might wonder how you prove such a thing. So actually, for IID variables, it's kind of easy. So I'll tell you for IID variables how you prove the asymptotic equipartition theorem. Um, yeah, the screen will move up in a bit. So imagine you have a, uh, you, you pick x1, x2, x3, a sequence like that IID, independent, identically distributed. So for the moment, we're ignoring correlations. Then here's a fact of life. Consider minus, uh, minus 1 over n, I'm drawing n such numbers, n, n such variables, minus 1 over n logarithm of the probability distribution, of the joint probability distribution. Then, this is of course because, the, the, uh, because it's IID, I can write this as sum on the individual draws of log of the probability of the xi, the symbol on the ith draw. So then by the weak law of large numbers, you know that this object converges in probability to minus the expectation value of log P of X. But that's precisely the entropy. So this is saying the log of the probability of a long string divided by N converges to the entropy. So with a little bit of work, you can show from this that all sequences that occur have the same probability and, and namely, this is the probability that they will have. The log of the probability is the entropy. And that because of this, since they all have the same probability, if you add up how many of these, you know, if you add up, you know, 2 to the h, uh, e to the h such sequences, then it fills up the probability and there's no room for anything else to happen. So that's how you derive the fact that there's a typical set. And within the typical set, the probability is given by 2 to the power h, the entropy 
of the uh, 2 to the power h times the length of the sequence. So this is a theorem you can prove in this way. If you want to prove this in more generality, where you don't pick the symbols independently and with identical distribution, that takes a little bit more work, of course, and we don't have time in today's lecture to prove that. Any questions? Okay. In which case, I'm going to go on to concept number two, which is the mutual information. So, so far, we've characterized a signal in terms of how variable expressive it is, uh, namely, or how many different messages you can get from it, or if you make the message very long, how big the typical set of messages you can send is. So, but often you're interested in a situation where you have a signal, you have some noisy channel, and you have an output R, and you want to ask how much information R contains about S. There are many, many applications like this, including in things like in, you know, if you have a neuron and you know it makes a message and you want to know how much the output tells you about the input. So some things are clear about what kind of things must be true. So for example, suppose you had four input signals and they were transmitted faithfully into outputs, then you clearly have perfect information and the response contains as much information as the signal. If instead the thing is noisy, namely S1 occasionally becomes R1 or R2, S2 becomes R1 or R3 once in a while, you know, stuff like this, then it's clear that the response should contain less information than the signal. If the output has a lower bandwidth than the input, that is to say two inputs become the same output, for example, then it's clear that the output has less information than the input. So whatever quantity we write down to characterize how much R tells you about S have to reflect these kinds of properties. So this, for example, again, take a neuroscience example. Suppose you have repeated experiments. So you produce the same input each time to this neuron. Sometimes you get this message. Sometimes you get this message. Sometimes you get this message. You know, it's more or less here. It's very active here. It's not active, but it's slightly different each time. That's like having this noise. And so somehow you have to have a way of accounting for the fact that something in the knowledge about the input has been lost by the time it got transmitted to the output. So the standard way to do this is as follows. So first you quantify how expressive the response is. So you say that the response is a sequence R1, R2, R3, the output of the channel is some sequence R1, R2, etc. And let's suppose it is drawn from some probability distribution. And so you measure that probability distribution. And then it's clear that the wider this distribution, the wider the response repertoire and the more entropy the response is going to have. So the total entropy, H total, is simply you take the responses and you compute the entropy. So that's the total number of bits transmitted by this channel. The point, however, is not all the bits that are transmitted may be informative about the input. It's like having a phone line and having noise on the phone line. Not all the bits being transmitted by the phone line are informative. So the next thing we need to quantify is the noise in the system. So for a given input, how variable is the response? So we can do that by saying, okay, wait. So suppose I have an input S. I can look at the conditional distribution of the output R given the input S. So if it was all completely deterministic, this distribution would be you know, completely focused. It would be delta function. But if it's not, if there's no noise, let's say, this distribution will be wider. So the wider this distribution, this conditional distribution of output given input, the more the noise and the more the entropy associated, the more information you're losing to noise. So you do this, so you quantify this by computing the noise entropy given the input to the channel S. So you compute the conditional entropy that we discussed earlier, where you take probability of R given S, log probability of R given S, and then you compute, you know, for a fixed S, you compute this entropy. And then the thing called the noise entropy is the average of this over all possible inputs that you could have distributed, that you could have put into the system. So this quantity, the noise entropy, quantifies the bits of information lost to noise. So the mutual information, which is supposed to quantify how much the output of the channel R tells you about the input to the channel S, that quantity is uh, measured as the bits transmitted minus the bits lost to noise. So it's the total entropy of the output minus the noise entropy. And there are many ways of writing this. We can just write out explicitly the expression in terms of the probability distributions. 
And it's often written as the mutual information. You take the letter I for that, I of S and R. And you can write this as the response entropy minus the conditional entropy of the response given the stimulus. So that's a standard expression. Now, this is also an object with many interesting properties. So I've, I've flipped pages. And oh, so there it is. The new pages come up. So, um, so for example, you can take the expression we started with and use basically Bayes' rule and factorization properties and probability distribution. So here's Bayes' rule. And by sort of working with Bayes' rule, I won't work through the details of the algebra. You, know, you just plug in Bayes' rule and you manipulate this expression a few times. You can show that the mutual information between the output and input is also given by I, S, and uh, um, um, uh, I'm not sure whether I wrote it earlier. Basically, you can show that I, S, and R, the information conveyed by S about R, is the same thing as the information conveyed by R about S. Namely, it's a reciprocal quantity. You have the input and the output of the channel. And whatever the input tells you about the output is the same. How, however much the input tells you about the output is the same as the amount that the output tells you about the input. So I'm not going to work through these details of these little calculations. This is for you to work out as exercises if you want, because these are sort of elementary computations of algebra. And you can work out a whole bunch of properties. You can work out that mutual information between R and S is the same as the mutual information between S and R. There are various expressions. This tells you that the mutual information between the output and the input is less than the, infra, than the entropy of the output. Right, the, uh, you can't send more. You don't know more about the input than the amount of entropy in the output. Likewise, the mutual information, the output, and input is less than the entropy of the input. There can't be more sent from the channel than came into it in the first place. You know, things of this kind. So this all makes good sense. And um, there are other expressions further that are more symmetric between the input and the output. Let's not worry about the continuous version of this. It's the same kind of calculation. Again, I left it there for reference. So um, am I correct in thinking that I have like 15, 20 minutes left? Uh, yes, uh, 18. OK, in which case, what I would like to say is that uh, um, so I've written down here a set of exercises that you guys should work out. The answers to the exercises are here. But what I've basically done is that there is a standard example in which you can train your imagination for these kinds of things, which is called a symmetric binary channel. You have inputs 0 and 1 coming into the channel, and there's a probability alpha that the input is faithfully transmitted to the output, and there's a probability 1 minus alpha so that it goes this way. So as you can imagine, if your probability of getting scrambled is 1 half, you should get zero mutual information here. And if your probability of being transmitted faithfully is 1, then you should have perfect information in the output. So you should work that example out and the detail just, just to give, a, give yourself a sense of how mutual information works. And I wrote out the exercise here so that you can check yourself. But you'll see that the, the words I just said, that if you randomize the output, you get zero mutual information. And if you have perfect transmission, then you have perfect mutual information. That, that works out. And that's for you to check as an exercise when you have a moment. OK. So these are all those examples. And then you can do more examples, more symbols, et cetera. So this is a page full of examples, two pages of examples for you to do. Now I'd like to come to some important properties of this quantity. First is, remember we talked about the chain rule for uh, entropy. There is similarly a chain rule for mutual information. And it goes like this. Suppose I have a bunch of variables, x1, x2 through xm, and some other variable y. And I have the mutual information between this collection of variables, x's and y. Then the theorem, the chain rule theorem, says that the mutual information between x and y conditioned, well, that this mutual information is equal to the, there's a missing thing here. Um, uh, sorry, there's a missing thing here. Let me put it in. There should be an I, and there's an I. Yeah. So the uh, that this uh, this expression for the mutual information between all these variables and Y can be written as you take mutual information between each X I in turn and Y 
conditioned on the other variables. So there's an expression of this kind, and the proof of this is, you know, it's pedestrian. You take, you write out the mutual information in terms of the entropies, then you apply the chain rule for the entropies, you manipulate that, and you discover that this chain rule for the mutual information. So the same thing we showed earlier, uh, using, you know, factorization of probability distributions produces this. The reason I want this here, the reason I want this here is because this chain rule leads to an extremely important property. It leads to a property called the data processing inequality. So suppose X, Y, and Z are processes that form a Markov chain. So this is the entry point into things like stochastic processes using these kinds of techniques. That is to say, so if, if they form a Markov chain, what this means is that if you take the variables x and y, then the distribution over x and z conditioned on y, which is simply the probability distribution of x, y, and z, the joint distribution divided by the probability of y, this factorizes into the product of the conditional distributions x and y, y, and z. In other words, if I know y, if I know y, then the distribution over x and z become independent variables. So that's the Markov property that this intermediate variable factorizes the thing on the two sides. So suppose that's the case. Then you can show that if there's a process of this kind, then the mutual information between X and Y exceeds the mutual information between X and Z. This basically saying you can lose information in a process, like a physical process or an information transmission process, but you can't gain information from nothing, right? If you want to know how much X tells you about Z, it's necessarily going to be, or how much Z tells you about X, it's necessarily less than or equal to what Y tells you about X, so the chain of transmission. So the proof is easy if you use the uh, chain rule. So using the chain rule, if you have the mutual information X and Y and Z, this is equal to the mutual information in X and Z plus the mutual information X and Y given Z. Or you could factorize it the other way using the chain rule. This is the mutual information between X and Y plus the mutual information between X and Z conditioned on Y. But the Markov property tells you the mutual information in X and Z given Y is zero. That's because the distributions factorize. So in that case, because it's Markov, the distributions factorize. And because they factorize, the two are independent variables. And one of the exercises that I've given you is to show that if the variables are independent, they have no mutual information. Clearly, if they're independent, one doesn't tell you anything about the other. So once you have that, you can wipe this out. And so you see immediately that the positivity of this quantity, of this mutual information, implies that the mutual information in X and Y exceeds the mutual information in X and Z. So in other words, as you go keep processing the data, you can only lose information. So that's a very important property that arises from these sort of elementary facts about factorization of probability distributions processed through the engine of the mutual information. Okay, any questions? Oh. Uh, Actually, let me say one more thing and then take questions. So all of this has one extremely important application. That's called the channel coding theorem. This is, uh, wait, the page hasn't moved. Uh, can you tell me when the page moves for you? Yes, so we are still in data process inequality. Okay. But well, now okay. we're halfway to the next page. Ah, there we go. Great. So. Now I'm going to talk about the channel coding theorem. So imagine that you have a signal W, you encode it into some sequence of X's. And that sequence of X's gets transmitted through a noisy channel. So the noisy channel is defined by distribution for what Y comes out given that you stick X into the channel. So there's a quantity called the channel capacity, which is the maximum over all distributions over X of the mutual information between X and Y. And that mutual information gets defined by two things, this characterization of the channel, the characterization of the noise in the channel, and it's also defined partly by what distribution you put on X. So the encoder is supposed to produce some distribution over X, and then that gets transmitted through to distribution over Y. And we're going to see that that is this quantity, the channel capacity, is the maximum 
reliable information rate, the maximum error-free information rate over the channel. So this is the central theorem of information theory. This is why Shannon worked on information theory. So more specifically, the theorem says that for something called a discrete memoryless channel, so there's no correlations, all information rates below this channel capacity C are available. So so long as you're trying to stuff a signal through that it has a lower information rate than C, the channel capacity, I should put the letter C, um, all of these are achievable. So we don't have time for the full proof. But I can give you an idea of the proof using the asymptotic equipartition property and the things we've already said. So imagine you have these X's. So this is the encoded signal. Now, because of noise, and uh, so it's going to go through the channel. And when it comes out of the channel, it's going to come out as a Y. But because of the noise in the system, if I stick in a particular X, there's a whole bunch of different Y's that can appear. So it basically, the transmission fuzzies the X, makes it more fuzzies, and it sort of spreads it out in some way. Now I'm going to use the asymptotic EP partition property that we talked about. And imagine that I'm sending a very long message. If I send a very long message, I know that basically um, I, I can use the typicality property. That if I look at very long messages, YN, all the messages that appear are within the typical set, and each of them uh, and there are e to the n h possible such messages. It's uh, because of this, uh, this thing has some entropy h of y. It's not the case that all possible sequences of y to the n appear. You get e to the n times the entropy of y sequences that appear on the output. That's a, that's a result from the asymptotic e partition theorem. Now, imagine that I had tried to put in a particular um, encoded symbol X. Well, I know that this is going to get spread out into this region. Right? But now, if I give you many, 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 many instances of this, I also know from the asymptotic equal partition theorem that the size of this set is going to be like e to the n times the entropy of y given x. Right? Because the, I condition on the fact that I've put an X and I see how many Y's come out and that conditional distribution, its entropy, tells me the size of the set according to the asymptotic equipartition theorem. So now we see what we can do. What I can do is I can take the set of all possible things that might come out and divide it up into pieces. And the number of separate pieces that I can have here is the number of things I can faithfully encode. So indeed, what you do is, so then you take the total number of things you could say, e to the n times the entropy, this should have been of y, uh, entropy of y. Um, uh, oops, the entropy of y. And then I divide it by the entropy of y given x. And that by definition or construction is precisely uh, n times, the uh, there's an n there, the mutual information in x and y. So that's the number of faithful values you can encode. This is a heuristic proof. To really do this right, you have to be able to you know, control the errors in the statements. You have to be able to show that this is achievable, that there exists an encoding of X that allows you to do this basically, because otherwise it could happen that this ball overlaps with the next ball, overlaps the next ball, so everything gets confused. So what you need to know is that there exists some encoding, at least asymptotically, that they don't overlap and that you can decode them separately. And that's the kind of thing that Shannon showed. And that's like a lecture's worth of, of discussion. So I have, what, a few minutes, but I'm going to go ahead and, uh, uh, Matteo, uh, I would propose to take 10 minutes into the, uh, into the discussion time. I hope that's okay. That's okay. Yes. I don't see many questions, so, yeah. Okay. So, um, so let's go through the uh, last topic. So I've talked about entropy, mutual information. The last topic, basic topic in information theory that I think you need to know is something called the relative entropy. So let me explain what that is. So besides giving you ways of characterizing how much information is transmitted by things, information theory also gives you useful ways of quantifying how different two distributions or modes of transmitting information are. So there are many standard ways of quantifying differences between 
functions, the distribution of the functions. So for example, famously, there's the L1 distance, which is, you know, you take the difference between your two functions or distributions and you take the absolute value, you add it up. There's the L2 distance, which is you take the difference, you square it, you add it up, right? So basically all of these distances treat functions as infinite dimensional vectors. But there is another quantity called the relative entropy or kullback lieber divergence, which is the thing that information theory teaches you is a good measure of distance or difference between distributions. And this thing appears again and again. So here's how that's defined. Suppose P and X and Q of X are probability distributions. Then the relative entropy, also called the kullback lieber divergence or DKL PQ, is the integral over all the samples of P of X log P of X over Q of X. So I want to discuss this quantity and why it's useful. So the first thing I'd like to explain is a positivity property that this thing has. So uh, uh, waiting for this to move to the next page. OK, here. OK, so, um, so we're, we're trying to get to something called Jensen's inequality. Okay? That, uh, and its application to this uh, to 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 relative entropy. So so first I need a definition or two. So first of all we're going to agree that f is convex if it satisfies these technical conditions. For the purposes of this talk, it's convex if it bends up this way, right? And you can write that out carefully as saying if I take a weighted sum of two inputs to the function, then the function acting on this weighted sum is less than or equal to the weighted sum of the function acting on the individual inputs. So right here, there's a weighted sum of inputs to the function. And here you take the function on the inputs, and then you weight that. And this inequality tells you that the function is convex. So you can check that that's the case. So there's an inequality called Jensen's inequality, which says that if f is a convex function, so in other words, it does this, then the expected value of x, of f of x, so x is supposed to be some random variable, then if f is convex, the expected value of f of x, uh, this should have been, is bigger than or equal to, yeah. the expected value of f of x is bigger than or equal to f of the expected value of x. So basically, if you push the expectation value in, you can state that there is some inequality. And the proof of this is basically by applying this convexity condition recursively. You can just uh, do this recursively, and then you'll find out that this is true. So now I'm going to apply Jensen's inequality to the kullback liebler divergence of the relative entropy. So the theorem we want to have is that the relative entropy between two distributions, P and Q, is non-negative with equality only if and only if the two distributions are equal. So the way you see this, is you write out your relative entropy or minus the relative entropy. So that looks like minus the sum on x, p of x log p of x over q of x. So putting in the minus sign to the log, that's sum on x, p of x log q of x over p of x. So this looks like an expectation value. So I'm going to use Jensen's inequality to push the expectation value inside the log, recognizing here that the log minus the log is a convex function. So log is a concave function. So I've pushed it in and got this inequality. Now the p's cancel, and this is log, and then the sum on q of x is 1, so you get log 1 and 0. So we find that minus the relative entropy is negative, so the relative entropy is positive. Okay, so that's a very important property. Likewise, there's a chain rule property that just let's not, let's not bother with. The net things coming out of this are two, three very important facts. One is we just proved that the relative entropy is always positive. You can also check that it's zero if P equals Q. Uh, one sort of annoying thing about the relative entropy is that it's not symmetric. So the relative entropy between P and Q is not the same thing as the relative entropy between Q and P just because of the way it's defined. So because of this, so this almost looks like it should be a measure of distance, right? So basically, if I take two different distributions, you get some positive distance between them, positive relative entropy. But if P and Q are equal, it's zero. So that almost feels like there's a measure of distance in some sense. 
But because it's not symmetric, it's not kind of a metric in the usual sense. And normally, you know, if A is one meter from B, then B is one meter from A, and this doesn't satisfy quite that property. But nevertheless, we're going to find it's very useful to think about the relative entropy or the kullback lieber divergence as a distance between distributions. So that's what I'm going to end with today, about using it in that way. So there are various ways of seeing this. The first way is by looking at the law of large numbers. Suppose you draw n data points from, oops, this page hasn't changed. This is sort of inefficient. Um, but there, I'm just waiting for the page to move. Yeah, I know. Um, hello? Oh, okay. It moved, yeah. So let's look at the, so I'm going to first look at the law of large numbers. So suppose you draw n data points from a distribution Q of X, and let P of X be the empirical distribution of the data, namely the frequency of counts divided by n, right? So here's Q, the true distribution, P of X is the empirical distribution. So here's a statement of fact, it's a result in information theory. The probability that the empirical distribution you get is some particular P of X is bounded on the two sides by two to the power minus N times the relative entropy between P and Q times some numbers. So what this tells you is that, of course, the most likely thing you get is when DKL is zero. So the most likely thing you're going to get is going to be the, uh, well, P is going to be Q. Actually, P is going to be very close to Q in the sense of DKL. So this quantifies, this quantifies the sense in which the empirical distribution of data converges to the true distribution. And the quantity that is relevant is the relative entropy or the kullback lieber distance between the empirical distribution and Q. So if you want to ask a question, I draw some data, how far away do I expect the distribution I get in the data to be from the truth? It's the relative entropy that controls that. This is why it's such an important quantity, right? It controls the nature of the convergence of data to the truth. Okay. So and in this way, it sort of underpins much of the universal behavior um, as you take finite size systems and make them large. So I've moved to the next page, but it hasn't moved yet. Mateo, do tell me when the page moves to number two. Yeah, I'm sorry about the slow uh, shift. Yeah. Great. So here's another kind of application in statistical inference and the theory of learning. So suppose you're trying to, rather than sort of modeling the data, what you have is you have two possible models or distributions, call them P and Q. And I want to know how well can you tell these distributions apart with finite data? Maybe you can tell them apart, maybe you can't with finite data. So let's suppose you have events E1 through EM, which have been drawn independently from either P or Q, and your job is to guess whether P or Q generated the data. So I'm going to define two possible, two kinds of errors, two-sided errors. One is the probability that you guess Q, but the truth is P. And the other one is the probability that you guess P, but the truth is Q. So these are two errors. We would, of course, like to pick an inference strategy such that alpha n and beta n, both of these error probabilities are both small, okay? Now, suppose you devise an algorithm with alpha n, the one-sided error, less than epsilon, the epsilon some small number, and let beta n epsilon be the smallest possible error on the other side with this constraint on the first error. So one error is small, guaranteed, and I want to know how small can you make the other error. So there's a theorem called the Chernoff-Stein lemma, and it says that the limit 
as the amount of data goes to infinity of minus one over n times the logarithm of this other error is the kullback lieber divergence. So this is a fundamental limit on inference. It says that if P and Q are very close in um, a very close in the sense of relative entropy of kullback lieber divergence, then it's very, very difficult to tell them apart. And there's bounds on how, how quickly you can squeeze the error down in telling them apart, how much data you need to tell them to beat the error down beyond a, beyond a certain amount. So there's a second sense in which the relative entropy is such an important quantity. So I've moved to the third page. Um, and I don't know if you can see it yet. Do let me know if you can. No, I think we can, we still see infinite data limit best you can possibly do. Okay, so let's wait for page three. Tell me when you see page three, okay? Yeah, yeah, sure. Again, I'm sorry about the delay, but there's nothing to be done. <laughs> yes, yes, no worries. Okay, so we can see half of it. Yes, now it's fine. Great. So the next thing is, remember in the previous uh, section, we talked about mutual information as an important quantity, right? Characterizing how much one thing says about the other. Well, there's actually a relationship in relative entropy and mutual information. So suppose P of X and Y is a joint distribution of X and Y. And uh, therefore, let me suppose that P of X distribution. So life that X and Y are uncorrelated and hence are uninformative about each other, hence have no mutual information with each other, then the joint distribution is a product of the two. So it turns out that the expressions I gave you earlier for the mutual information are exactly the same as writing down the relative entropy or kullback liebler divergence between the joint distribution and the product of the two marginals. So in a very real sense, the mutual information is quantifying how different is the true joint distribution from the product of the marginals. Namely, how much more do you actually know? Does, does one variable tell you about the other if you have the full joint distribution as opposed to just the marginal distributions which act as if they're independent? And so there's a corollary here, which is that the mutual information is non-negative because we already said that the relative entropy is non-negative. We showed that, right, using Jensen's inequality. So that tells you the mutual information between two variables is also non-negative. So, you know, there's lots of other cool facts that suggest that the relative entropy is a good measure of probabilistic distance. Okay, so what's the time? Um, yes, so uh, you have uh, you have passed eight minutes of your quota. Don't worry, I think we still have some time and because there is no question anymore, not even in the chat box. Excellent. In that case, I have two more slides and I would be happy to just go forward and... Uh, and uh, uh, wait a second, just, uh, I think there is a question in chat. So right. Fazia is asking, uh, could you please tell what applications it has? Uh, what, the relative entropy? Uh, I don't know. Uh, maybe uh, Fazi, you, you can just unmute yourself and ask the question. Hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, actually, I, I'm following your lecture, and but I lost a little bit. Uh, what is the application in general? Maybe end of the uh, lecture, you can tell it. I don't know. I have no idea where I can use it. Uh, I mean, I don't see it nowhere. Uh, what's it? I mean, uh, in total and whole of the lecture, I, I have no idea where we can use it and what is the application of that. I'm just following some relation and some uh, theorem, but uh, I don't know what is the physics behind and uh, maybe sure. the technology so, behind. For example, for example, uh, you know, uh, you can use the notion of mutual information to characterize how much a neuron says about its input. That's a, that's a very important application that people have. 
Uh, another thing you can do is in coding theory, what you do is you try to devise uh, using the channel coding theorem. If you characterize a noise in a channel, you try to devise a distribution. The, 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 the problem of encoding signals is a problem of devising a distribution over the inputs to the channel that achieves the channel capacity. So I described the channel capacity theorem. So what you do is you characterize the noise in the signal and then you have to derive an algorithm to maximize the channel capacity, to meet the channel capacity. That's another application. So- um, I see, uh, sorry. And uh, you mean that most of the application is in uh, neuroscience and in the uh, neuro, I, I don't know. To I, 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 said, I, mentioned I mentioned neuroscience because you know uh, that's an area I work in. But you know the phone company, the cell phone company, uh, uses that kind of thing all the time, right? This was originally mm -hmm. devised by Shannon to characterize signals being sent on electronic cables uh, in the presence of noise to decide how much information was being transmitted. What I'm describing now with the relative entropy has many other applications. So, for example, mm -hmm. I alluded here to questions of statistical inference from data. So, suppose I give you data and I tell you which model produce those data. That's the general problem of scientific inference. So if you try to suggest that problem, if you try to address that problem and ask how to trade off which model to pick, the relative entropy becomes the quantity that controls which model you pick. Okay, I see. It thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. Right, so let me finish with uh, uh, talking about the uh, about this, uh, um, uh, about the relative entropy, well, uh, about the DKL. So let me ask the question now that uh, uh, whether the relative entropy can actually function as an actual distance metric on uh, probability distributions in some situations. So to be an actual measure of distance or separation, it has to be positive, symmetric, and satisfy the triangle inequality. Okay. So let's forget about the Jensen Shannon. So here's one way of doing this. So suppose P of X and Q of X are parametrized by parameters alpha and beta are two models on a parameter manifold. Then we can think of P and Q being, as we've said already, separated by some distance DKL alpha beta, right? I mean, so, so this is the same relative entropy between the distributions indexed by alpha and beta. But actually, what you can do is you can expand this locally if P and Q are close to each other. So you take beta, the alpha plus epsilon. So these are two very nearby models. So it's like this, very close to each other. Uh, they're very close to each other. Then you can expand the relative entropy between the two models as follows. Let's say that D alpha beta is, you know, you take alpha is the parameter vector of the first model alpha plus epsilon is a parameter vector the second model. And then you do a Taylor expansion near epsilon being equal to zero. So now, as we said earlier, if I have two models that are identical to each other, two distributions that are identical to each other, their relative entropy will be zero, so that's gone. Now, uh, it's also the case that therefore, the since the relative entropy is positive everywhere, um, it'll be minimized when the two models are identical, so when epsilon is zero, so that means the first derivative with respect to the parameters will be zero. And then you have the second derivatives. So you have a quadratic form here, the second derivatives of the relative entropy with respect to the parameters. So there's a matrix of parameters here. So this is, some, this is an important quantity, it's called the Fisher information. So let's uh, move to the next page. I'm waiting for it to go to the next page. Let me know when it comes to the next page. Yes, sure. Yes. Half a bit. Yes. So, all right. So locally, if I have two parametrized models that differ by a little bit in their parameters, we see that the relative entropy between them is one half times, you know, basically matrix JIJ multiplying these little parameter differences. You add this up, right? So this is basically like, uh, right. So this JIJ is something called the Fisher information. 
and is another very important quantity in uh, statistics and information theory. So the Fisher information, because it's symmetric and positive and stuff like that, it's a true metric or distance function on a parameter manifold. And this is in the sense of differential geometry. It's a true metric on the space. So given this metric, you can define distances between probability distributions as follows. So using the methods of differential geometry, you take your metric, you multiply it by the differential to the path you're taking between two points, and then you add it up, you take the square root. And so that's the little amount of path length in each little segment there. And if you integrate it up, this is a path that goes between, this is the length of a path of this path, of a path between these two points. So now you can do use things like the tools of differential geometry. You can find geodesics or shortest distance paths in this kind of metric. And that is the topic of the entire field of information geometry. And you can look at the book by Shunichi Amari, a well-known professor from Japan, who was very influential in this uh, field. And, uh, um, uh, and it's used and these kinds of techniques using you know, trajectories in this Fisher information metric are used to understand properties of inference and, uh, and, and learning. So you know, uh, learning in general involves you start with some model uh, somewhere on this model manifold, that's what you assume. You get data and the data, every time you get data, you uh, modify the learned model by a little bit and then you get more data and you modify your learned model a little bit. And in the end, you're supposed to make it to the truth. So uh, the question, uh, many questions in the theory of learning and machine learning can be partly cast in terms of trajectories on the space of mental models you have or machine or the models that the machine has. And you might try to characterize that efficient learning would be in some way a geodesic or shortest trajectory in these kinds of senses. Uh, on these uh, on these manifolds. So let me finish uh, well, as follows. There are many challenges here. So for example, if I just take challenges involving uh, the relative entropy, uh, one challenge is uh, uh, using the ideas that I just described. I've moved to the next page, by the way, you can't see it, but I'm just talking so that I can get finished uh, for your sake. So um, as I said, in online learning, namely if you have a system that starts with an initial distribution that's trying to learn another one, there's some trajectory an efficient learner would take, and that would be presumably characterized in terms of shortest paths in this kind of metric derived from the relative entropy, and it'd be interesting to understand that. So I've come to my summary page, but uh, I can't see it on my screen, so. Yes, you also can see. <laughs> so we will wait. Actually, let me just start talking because there isn't, there aren't any equations or anything there. Uh, so, yes, so so there, there there is a question in chat uh, by mm -hmm. Zabrin. So uh, Zabrin, I think you can just ask uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, so the question was related to the law of large numbers and uh, uh, what I understood is that uh, if somehow we know the DKL between two probability distributions uh, in the real sense, we can see that how many uh, uh, realizations we need to uh, basically estimate the true picture. And uh, I wanted to ask if you had some comments about uh, how we can relate it to uh, simulations and experiments. So somehow if you have a simulation of a system and through that you can get uh, two probability distributions and you can get, uh, of course, very many data points than you could get experimentally. Is there a way we can estimate how many experimental realizations and we need to get close to the true picture? Yeah, so suppose you have a, suppose you have a, um, let's suppose you have a, uh, model right which tells you that the data ought to be generated your theory says by some uh, by some distribution q and what you want to know is empirically you want to gather data and you want to know is it true that in the world uh, uh, it's really q uh, q of x is really the distribution then you could use this kind of thing to ask yourself the question uh, um, how likely is it that with n data points 
I would by mistake get a distribution P, even if the truth is Q. The probability of producing, uh, you know, that the empirical distribution will deviate by a certain distance from the truth you can compute. So then that allows you to put error bounds on the confidence with which you know that the empirical distribution you have measured is or isn't likely to have been generated from the truth that your theory claimed. So it takes a little bit of manipulation, but it's that it's you can do that kind of thing. Yes. Uh, I have a question. Yes, please go ahead. Um, hi, uh, I'm Vinita. So, I mean, it was a very interesting talk. Uh, so I work in mainly uh, glassy granular systems and all of this looks very kind of being able to connect, but it's just that I'm not able to make this connection of how to use relative entropy to characterize very different states, for example, in granular systems or glassy systems, because there are aspects of memory that people look into these systems where we have many particles and their degrees of freedom, um, which is kind of controlling the overall mechanical property. For example, being able to go from structure to dynamics. Um, but how do I kind of um, understand, meaning condense all such information into um, using the information theory? How do I kind of make yeah. uh, that understanding better in some sense? I don't know whether I'm expressing what I think you clearly, but, uh, but I just want to kind of know if there is a way of going from uh, static information, uh, which does affect the dynamics that I do know, because I can characterize it in different ways. Um, but how do I use the concept of, um, I don't know, relative entropy or being able to yeah. use these so, quantities to measure it? So uh, uh, what you're asking is a, is a complicated and subtle question and a very good one. Uh, I will not give you a satisfactory answer in a short period of time. We need to spend some time at a blackboard. So, um, but uh, to just give you very snippets of relevance, um, so there is absolutely no question that thinking about, for example, if you have a glassy system with a sort of complicated landscape of you know, minima and the, uh, the, you have one distribution, you have another distribution, how, how do you compare these things, that these kinds of tools are relevant. In fact, uh, there are uh, famous works by people like uh, um, Lenka Zibadarova and uh, Florent Shakala and the whole Okay. I think there is some loose connection, right? Is yes. It that I'm not only one hearing it. Yes, yes, that's true. Uh, Vijay, uh, anyone can... got that reference? Uh, sorry, I think uh, BJ is not there. BJ, can you hear? Can you hear us? Okay, I think there is some some issue. I think he he will reconnect. So I cannot see him on the participants list now. Can, can can you hear me? Uh, anyone in the in the participant list? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. Yes. You. Okay, okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, I don't know why uh, Vijay uh, is not here. Maybe he's tr trying to reconnect.
Sorry, guys, I don't have any idea. Uh, no, he's still not here. Let me just try to connect with him. Okay, so we have just passed the time constraint. So, so let's let's wait a couple of minutes. I'm trying to connect with him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was an interesting question. Uh, did anybody get uh, the reference he was t telling? Uh, no, actually, no. I think. Uh, 
no no there is uh, no no nothing in the chat so maybe the, the one thing is that okay you can always uh, of course send messages or emails to him uh, asking mm. for the references mm. but okay this was not supposed to be the way it should end <laughs> i'm so sorry no problem okay. Uh, okay, so someone is asking in the chat uh, that uh, the lecture notes or tutorial will be available. I, I, I can tell you that the, the videos will be available on the website for sure. And... Uh, Okay. Please kindly share the link whenever it's available. It will be very helpful. Uh, yes, I think uh, you will get. Uh, so the the website is the same. So for the for the particular, uh, I mean, for this workshop, if you go to the ICTP page, so there is this uh, dedicated website for the, this work workshop, right? So uh, yeah. when you you will see that. Uh, just below the each of the uh, lecturers, there will be some link to the video or uh, if there is any lecture not available, you will get the thing. But I, I know that the videos will be there for sure. Okay, thank you very much. And then the slides, is it possible to get the slides as well? Uh, yes, because I think we are going to provide the recorded Zoom session. So, oh, okay, so you are asking for the PDF files, right? Yes, uh, yes. yes. That I don't know because that depends on the on the speakers. But okay, I can ask them. Okay, uh, thank you. Okay, so I just got a reply from Vijay. So he's trying to reconnect, but somehow it's not going through. Uh, Okay, so in in the chat uh, there is a, a message from Moritz, and uh, I think he's mentioning the the references that uh, Vijay uh, uh, told us. It's Linka. Uh, I, I don't know how to pronounce it. Devrova. Uh, Moritz, can can you can you just uh, pronounce it for us? I'm not super certain myself how her last name is pronounced. As okay, then what I can so do I can is... put it in the chat. Yes, yes. Okay, what I can do is that uh, let me just uh, send it to everyone. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I have an accident, I put, send it only to you. Okay. 
Yes, I think now everyone can uh, see this, the names, right? Mm, yes, yes, thank you. Okay, so, okay, sorry guys, I think then we should, we have to end uh, this session. So, uh, unfortunately, it didn't went well to the end and hopefully uh, you will join on uh, Monday, 22nd May. I hope uh, you enjoy and uh, any question for me? Okay, so then then let's let's end the session and uh, okay, see you in the in the next session on Monday. Okay, thank, thank you. you, thank you very much for joining. Thank you. Bye. Bye.